Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Cambridge Inside Out. My name is Robert Winters, and over in the other corner, I am Patrick Barrett again. <laughs> right, he's like a bad penny. We just can't right. seem to lose this guy. You know, we're, you know, we're working on it, right? <laughs> I think a lot of city councilors would describe me exactly like that. Uh, that's true. Well, I mean, as long as you do good work, this is all that really matters. So today is uh, October 18th, 2022. Yep. And, um, and before we start getting into some of the local stuff here, I'm going to just sort of speak personally here, because having just gone through an, a home invasion this past week of sorts, not a real home invasion, but... Um, uh, we, we actually had the, uh, under the mass save program, this Nico company came by, invaded my house, drilled holes in every one of the outer walls of the building from the inside and pumped insulation in. And it was three days of living hell. Um, but, but now we're going to have a warmer house in the wintertime, a cooler house in the summertime. And remarkably, uh, when the windows are closed now, I can barely hear the street in front. So it's a actually much ready house. Good for you. So I guess it is, you know, in a, in a way. So it's uh, and it cost me all of nothing, which was great. So I'm not a person who who lives <sighs> from handout to handout. But uh, but, you know, I, listen, the way I look at it, I've been paying my utility bills for a long, long time. I That's the Democrats time. for you. Yeah, well, right. well, I, this was nice to get a little something back after all these years of exorbitant bills, and hopefully there'll be much smaller bills now, but we'll see. Or at least they'll break even because the costs are going to be a lot higher this winter uh, per unit, and if I we use less units, then maybe I'll just break even. I'll be happy with that, so that'd be cool. So, uh, Meanwhile, Mr. Barrett. Uh, yes, yes. Perhaps what we could do is we could just sort of, let's start off here tonight and talk just a little bit about one of the principal items we could hit on other things as well that occurred at last night's city council meeting. And what, is, and what a city council meeting it was, Bob. It was indeed. <laughs> so so you've, you've been uh, uh, one of the more knowledgeable and for, at least for me, helpful persons to learn a little bit about some of the the more subtle aspects of what we call incentive zoning and mm -hmm. linkage. You know, there was a proposal to do a significant second round of big significant increases to the so-called linkage payment for new commercial development. Massive increases, really. Yeah. I mean, it used to be just a few bucks per square foot, and then it went to like 12 and then to 15, and then now it jumped to 33, something yeah, like that. Yeah, dollars and 34 cents. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you know, you were on the we were on the program before, and you talked a little bit about that. So, yep. so Patrick, tell us what happened. Well, um, so throughout this entire process, I mean, Quentin's on been brought an amendment, you know, ages ago, just to simply raise the rate. No other real nuance to it, um, and somewhat in violation of the Nexus study that they were looking at that said, you know, you should raise the rate. Um, if everything remains uh, like 2019 um, and continues on. And uh, even then you should still incrementally raise the rate a few dollars here, a few dollars there. Um, to me, the study, if you read the Nexus study, you kind of read it in between the lines of the study. It was really saying, you know, if the world remains untouched by, you know, in high interest rates, high construction costs, um, you know, in a recession, you should, you know, maybe even baby step this forward. Quentin said, no, thank you. Uh, I know, I, I know better than the study and found this amendment. And so I took it upon myself to say, okay, um, maybe this is an opportunity. We can look at some, perhaps some nuance. Um, and Councillor Azim introduced two amendments. Uh, one was to, um, to provide an exemption for the first 30,000 square feet of a building that was later amended by Councilor Mark McGovern to cap it off for buildings no greater than 60,000 square feet. And the second amendment was to exempt existing square footage for um, buildings that are raised. So if, say if I have a 40,000 square foot commercial building, I knock it down. I don't lose that square footage when it comes to linkage because linkage is really supposed to be about, you know, the, the increased, uh, you know, building, the, the increase of uh, or the, the impact of the increase in exactly exactly right new, new built construction yeah and if you're not if this is just additive it shouldn't necessarily be a penalty for you plus it would incentivize people to say 
not use an existing building where it didn't make sense to do so um, and build something new that was efficient, uh, that you didn't have to blow in insulation towards like, like um, my house or, or that, you know, could possibly comply with our net zero regulations going down the pike. Um, this was a bridge too far for the Affordable Housing Trust and for some other folks. Right. And just so um, if for those, the handful of people who might not know that the money generated, the revenue generated through this incentive zoning or linkage payments was all supposed to be dedicated to affordable housing. Correct. How, however, however defined, right. And, you know, by and large, they've been, you know, their, their fund has increased considerably since the, the, since the larger increases back in 2015. But what you try to under what you try to what I try to explain is that that increase in funding it's all reliant on labs continually be built in the city because labs are the only use that really pays the bills for linkage. No, no, no one's building really large commercial facilities that aren't labs that can afford to pay linkage. So like the market kind of reverse engineered itself and said, okay, well since labs are all we can build, that's labs are all you'll get, which is what has happened, and. You know, even for existing structures like uh, our friends at Matimco just built the engine at 750 Main Street, 293,000 square feet of new lab in the old Polaroid buildings, which if you remember what a Polaroid is, um, <laughs> I do. Those buildings have been vacant since 2003, but they didn't pay a dime of linkage because they kept the existing structure. All I'm saying is I want that if I knock my building down. Right. Um, and I, I tried to explain this as best I could. And honestly, I wasn't sure where we would land, but uh, a coalition of the crazy uh, counselors, Toner, Azim, Simmons, uh, Nolan, and Carlone understood it. And they decided that they agreed with the principal. They understood the subject matter and they, uh, they passed and amended that second leg of the, of the petition. Um, and Really, the, 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 the large kudos goes to Quentin Zondervan for having the wherewithal to bring a zoning petition uh, to increase linkage, because otherwise I wouldn't have had an opportunity to amend it. So thank you, Quentin. Good job. Um, and, you know, I really think that his, his contribution to this entire discussion has gone way understated. Um, but <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, that passed five to four, and then the amended zoning package in its totality passed six to three, which, you know, Malin, Siddiqui, and Zondervan voted against it, which I'm not sure if they understood the ramifications of that vote, but had that linkage vote failed, then they would not have been able to bring the subject back for two years. All right. Uh, you, you, by the way, you, your, your uh, video just froze up a little bit, but we could oh. hear you still. So. Okay, good. So, so I mean, I, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm better heard than seen. I've been told. Uh, my <laughs> my, my uh, English go. teacher in high school actually told me I had a great face for radio. There we go. So um, in the end, so the it, the the tight votes. Now you know we don't haven't seen too many five to four and four to five votes lately. No, so no. it was kind of interesting, and the and the. You, you know the the coalitions were not the usual ones so it was but, but, I actually, worried, but, but i think it was, it was it was a dynamic that i've never imagined honestly it was not on my bingo card but in terms of like seeing the alignment of it i can see it i, I you know we're, we're about to have a bigger conversation about something called buto down the road and you know here's here are five people who are able to pragmatically see the nuance of an issue and then make a very make us make a vote on something that quite frankly I think most people thought was a fait accompli or that something was something you just could never touch. Um, and I just think overall, if you look at a 2019 Nexus study that says, you know, as long as everything stays great, continue to increase. And then going through a pandemic, understanding that we're in a recession or likely to be in one and that rates are where they are, construction costs are where they are, and still think that you can increase the rate the Affordable Housing Trust should really recognize, one, that this ship isn't going to last forever. It simply cannot. It's, un it's not tenable. Two, that the more we increase this rate, labs are being built in Waltham. They're being built in other towns where they never were before. And they're leaving Cambridge to do that. Um, and lastly, the same people who have brought you this rate increase or the, the attempt to do so have also brought you a lab ban. There's a lab ban on the table right now 
from the city council and committee, but also being uh, uh, Quentin Zondervan and his aide are, are cultivating signatures for a citizen's petition that's likely to wash up on our shores in the next couple of days. That right, will also be will be a citywide lab ban. In his last newsletter, he recommended reach out to the Cambridge Residence Alliance to get to, to you know, if you wanted to sign up. But what would the financial impact of that be on the affordable housing trust and linkage? Massively well, devastating. Let me let me let me touch on just a couple of the political aspects of that too. You know, just in terms of collegiality among city councilors, for starters, Whoa. there was already a, a petition, not petition, it was a city council order from Dennis Carlone that was calling for pretty wide scale banning of labs. Right, you know, which I always called some more the command and control way of doing politics. But the councilors debated a little bit, and I believe over the objections of Councilor Zondervan, possibly others, I can't remember, um, they actually sent it to committee and sort of says, "Okay, we got to think this through a little bit more before we sort of jump it." Right. So it is a little arrogant for the same city councilor Zondervan and his aide to immediately turn around and say, well, I know that all eight of my colleagues have decided they wanted to actually put this to committee and work this out in a better way. So we're just going to do an end run around my eight colleagues mm -hmm. and do a citizen petition to basically tell them to go screw themselves. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm sorry to say it exactly that, that way, but it seems to me like that is about as uh, the least collegiality as I could even imagine. Well, you know. Robert, I, I think when there's blood in the water, you're always going to find a few sharks. And I think that right now we have a weird time in our city. I haven't met the new city manager. We've only been, we've only, I mean, I've, I think we met trick or treating last year, but that's not really the same. Um, we've communicated by email a little bit. We, we haven't um, seen really a lot of, in my opinion, strong leadership in the council. And right now, you know, Quinton has really been driving a lot of the initiatives in the city um to no real response other than what i saw last night in this i think dennis carlone and patty nolan deserve a ton of credit they stuck their necks out they did the right thing which they they knew was based on logic and reason denise simmons as well um and paul toner and azim and you know to, the the fact that even the face of logic you have counselors who are still willing to vote against that that's a dangerous time for us to be in Right. Especially when you feel, when ideologically a, a council like Zondervan, who's smart, can paint those people into those ideological corners and they've got no escape. Right. Um, and what is it? I, mean, I think right now, that, I mean, I've been hearing it in Central Square because we have lots of issues there. Um, I think the feeling right now is no one's touching the bottom. Like no one feels like they're firmly grounded. So the city feels a little bit ca more chaotic than it should. Yeah. Um, and I hear that actually from a lot of quarters, including people who work within city departments, too. Yeah. You know, by the way, speaking of, uh, you know, both actually wouldn't be political uh, um, collegiality so much as it is sort of standing on your own two feet. Right. Uh, there was prior to the going into the vote last night on linkage, uh, one of the political organization of Better Cambridge, you know, basically put all their people on notice that you're supposed to vote for just the increase without any of these carve outs, none of these exemptions or whatever pretty much or else. And then uh, of their, I guess, six, well, for what it's worth, the people of six who they supported in the last election, three of them are the ones who basically went against them, not not in terms of the, the overall rate, but in terms of actually taking a broader look at the bigger picture and voting for some of these amendments to get a better project, even though the, the organization objected to doing so. Only in so, the city of Cambridge could you bump up an inclusionary rate to 40% of what it currently is the day after a pandemic in these market conditions and still have people saying you're anti-affordable housing. Which is ridiculous. <laughs> so summer, just for people, for the folks at home that don't follow this, Somerville's at $12. Boston, the, the Boston. I've heard of the city. $18. Yeah, $18. And it doesn't begin until 100,000 square feet. Right. So, you know, the, the, the hubris of some of these groups and like, I like a better Cambridge. I mean, I talked to them with some regularity and they were, I mean, they were also, again, they're also against my basement thing that I did years ago too, which I can't figure out why, but the, um, the, this nuanced piece of them for that was, a, was a bridge too far. Money was being left on the table. And I said, bullshit. You're making, you're, this is theoretical 
theoretical money based on environment, based on financial conditions that don't, that don't exist. And quite frankly, we missed, like, if you thought, you know, the, the time that we just went through, Robert, will we look past as a golden age for financing and development? Rates at 3% or below? I know people with, I know people right now have mortgages on their homes at like 2%, 2.5%. Um, construction costs at like 275, 350. Ugh. If there's anybody on the planet who wants to live in 2019 more, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, but like, but to, but to, but to legislate based on that is just irresponsible. Yeah. So anyway, we'll see. You know, I, I think maybe in my kind of hopeful sort of world, you know, the political organizations who think they own counselors ought to get slapped a little bit. So this is a little bit of a slap. I think they tried to slap back a bit today, put out yeah. a word to their whole big mailing list saying how disappointed we are with some mm. of our, our people you know, for not doing as they were told. Whereas I'm looking at going like, well, maybe I think I'm starting to like these people a little bit more for standing on their own two feet for a change, but which is There's good. something to be said for independent thought. And I think, you know, I, I have lived among you now for 14 years. I'm still learning your ways. I do consider myself the Jane Goodall <laughs> of Cambridge. But a lot of the stuff that you guys say, a lot of the stuff that you guys preach are absolutely the different, are absolutely at odds with each other. And in terms of when people say we're for affordable housing is not, I'm not for anything else, is not, I'm only for affordable housing. And I think that's where the rubber hits the road in terms of like the monies that they're getting for, for this. When you're building at, building at almost a million dollars a unit, I would like to audit that. Um, but at the same time, we need market rate housing. We need development in general. We also need to have fun. We need things that people enjoy, music venues, hotels, restaurants, other things, quality of life, my friends. I know. We, you, don't we have to feel, you don't have to feel bad about it. It's okay. You know, I've, there's a long history of this sort of single issuing things to death, though, whether it was affordable housing or open space, different times, you know, different things that were all the, uh, the emphasis. I remember a Sim City Council meeting years ago where somebody came came charging in there, going up to the microphone, back in the old rules when you could do it at almost any time of the meeting. And they were they were angry because don't you know, there's, you know, people out there can't afford a roof over their head and they're planting trees in front of City Hall. Like as if somehow, uh, because there was one uh, priority that therefore there could be no other priorities. Right. And I never, that image never left me. You well, know, <laughs> we have these we have these like groups where we have we have the housing people, which has always been the biggest group. We have the bike people. We have the tree people. And like, I would love to sit them all down and say, all of your ideas are interconnected. Let's try to work together. And, you know, it, it's just like th there's one one issue politics to me or what is why the reason why you have like why this country is in flames most of the time. We don't simply, we just don't see the bigger picture and we need, we, we, it's in a place like Cambridge is one of the few places where we actually have the luxury of being able to do that. And the fact that we don't is just to me, I don't understand it. No, no absolutely right. So um, just to switch gears a little bit, I mean, there are some other interesting things maybe we'll get to a little bit later mm -hmm. from the, uh, last night, but um, you know, one of the things I, since you and I both have some pretty close relationship with uh, the greatest square in Cambridge, it is central to our, Damn straight. our thoughts, right? Uh, yeah, we've we've actually gone through some tougher days in the last few yeah. months in terms of an, a little escalation of some of the more problematic behavior up to and including bullets flying on at least one or two occasions. So it's it's been bad, Robert. I, I think, you know, we had uh, some gunfire. We've had two shootings. We've had multiple stabbings. We've had two muggings over the past uh, three or four months. Um, we have a lot of influx of people coming from Boston um, to that have sort of moved out a good portion of our house population. Um, and right now, like given the work that I do with the bid, like we're where we're pretty much on the street every day. We know lots of the faces and names and places. That's part of our job. 
Um, we're seeing lots of new faces and all the old faces seem to be going away. Um, I've actually heard that from a number of sources is that, you know, the, you can have people who are troubled people, problematic people, but you can actually get to know a lot of them yeah. and, and find some sort of a awkward peace with people, well, whether they, you know, substance abusers, dr drug users, whatever, I, I would, but, I would, but many yeah. of those, many of those very same familiar faces are the ones who are actually have become afraid of some of the characters who were coming in and, and, um, and that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, talking about going back to 2019, like I wish I could go back to that version of Central Square too, because we had a very, the bid had a very good handle on the situation in Central Square in 2019 and the pandemic turned that upside down. And, you know, I had reached out to the public safety chair, uh, who's super nice guy, very, very, and, you know, engaged in the community and, and, and concerned about safety. And I'd asked him, you know, maybe we should have a meeting because you've only held one since you became the chair. Um, and that was met with a not positive response. Um, I think that, again, I have learned a tradition of the Cambridge liberal that uh, you tend to put yourselves in sort of finger puzzle like mental jams where a situation like violence, homelessness, drug abuse, substance abuse, alcoholism, um, and other things that sort of converge into one area that you don't really know what the proper response is. And it's either military action or it's do nothing. And so in the absence of no one wants military action, um, you, the answer is always do nothing. Um, and, you know, and we convene meetings and I've been to now them that I've been here for a long time. I've been to lots of these meetings where we say, oh, well, what do we, what can we do? And the answer is there's things you can do. And the things that you just have to say, here's sort of a code of conduct for the square. And here's where, where you know, and then there's, then there's the law. And how, are you, and how are we going to balance those two things out? But like simply not addressing it, especially when the, it rises to the level of violence that we're seeing is negligence, it's irresponsible. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and, you know, and, and I'll just again say, we've been watching the evolution of the, the business improvement district and the ambassadors and the way everybody interacted with the people. So they're, you know, the, the, the people with the bid uh, and, and the Cambridge police officers, you know, actually getting to know some of the people who are the, some of the troubled people, helping them out, going out of their way. The you know, bid is very good out. at what they do. Yeah. And you know, it's That's like right. everything the theoreticians talk about should be happening, you know, for alternate ways of actually doing, you know, working with the community and, as opposed to, you know, police charging in there. Well, the police, the bid, and many of these other people are like unsung heroes. They were doing everything that be, all the people say but, but, should be done, and they were pretty successful with it. But now, you, but now Robert, the, the, the police in Central Square are completely demoralized. You have, you know, people like, uh, you know, Councillor Zondervan, his aide who go around with their, with their cameras photo photographing, uh, ph photographing every interaction. Uh, looking for that civil rights moment. They thought they had it last year, but they ran to the defense of an unregistered sex offender instead. Whoops. Um, the uh, the state of, you know, the police officers in Central Square, like they, they show up, they sit in their cruisers. This is usually typical of, an, of, a, of a violent area. A lot of them are leaving the force. I've had six to leave and go to the fire department, um, which is interesting. If you, if you think about it, actually it makes it, I think I would have made that choice too. Uh, the fire department uh, has always enjoyed a certain glamour. Um, <laughs> you, know, you, you walk around with your axe and you kind of have a bit of a swagger. You hop on the red, uh, big red truck and drive around town. And uh, if you're a police officer, you're stuck, you know, cleaning, you know, trying to stop someone from actually taking a crap on a door. Um, and the police in Central Square have, I think, have been abused. Um, I think the police force in general has been abused in the city. We, they're the model for the country and we treat them like crap. Um, they're underfunded and they have a huge budget because we ask them to do everything. And then right. you introduce things like heart or you introduce the things like the alternative response group. That's currently the community response group. Well, that's the, well they did for as part of the, this, this, this year's fiscal, the, the, the budget, they created the community safety department and I right. wish them well, I will let me really be clear because to whatever degree you can siphon off some of the activities that maybe you know, the police shouldn't necessarily be the ones responsible for handling and you can find better ways to do that. I think that's great. 
my biggest concern is that we don't want to see an alternate one uh, an alternate response mechanism that finds itself by choice to be at odds with the police when they should be working cooperatively. No, with I, I want them to get their asses on the street as fast as possible because you know we can't rely on the police or even ask. It's not their job to be a, for, to be honest with you. Um, and to and to I mean I I've seen a, an officer friend of mine be spit on, punched in the back of the head. Had I saw a woman spit in his mouth two weeks ago. Yeah. And he didn't stab her, which is what I would have thought. <laughs> Pardon my language. But like I I was shocked at the amount of abuse these guys take. No, I'm, like, I am I am continually impressed at the level of restraint that that Cambridge police show. It wasn't always that way. You know, oh. 30 years ago. Maybe a different police force. Well, you talk about, that's another thing I've discovered as being the uh, Jane Goodall of the city. You talk about you talk to people about 30 years ago. Apparently, there was a golden age in cameras that I was not aware of. But <laughs> the, the, the the point I'm trying to make, and I'm sorry for using the ex explicatives, is that, and I would not stab anybody, but I think the, the point the point is they, they take a lot of abuse. They're extremely professional. They're probably the best in the country, and they need to be better supported. I think back to the the shooting that took place, I think it was 2018 uh, at, the, at the carnival and a live shooter, all, all tons of people. And that man was physically brought down. He wasn't shot, he wasn't stabbed. He was brought down by the police. That's a level of bravery that to me should have gotten on the key to the goddamn city. And we, and we, and we dismiss it. And yeah. to me, like how many good, how many more good deeds can they do? Or how much more good can you ask of someone before they simply say, I'm, I quit. I'm joining the fire department. Right. <laughs> or I'll, I'll seek uh, early retirement. Yeah. Well, we only got, we only got about 15 seconds here left. So uh, anyway, so, um, so in, in a few moments, we shall return and talk yes, a little bit shall. more about things around town, uh, you know, affecting all of us. Um, so um, uh, anyway, so I will guess we'll see you in a few minutes on Cambridge Inside Out.